give us a countdown please yes sir we live in 5 4 3 2 1 so good evening and welcome to this uh, moa webinar for further proceedings i'll hand it over to our convener dr prakash sigedar sir over to you sigedar sir yeah good evening everybody uh, can you listen me we can hear you sir yeah yeah good evening everybody uh, at the outset i am thankful to uh, organizing chairman uh, of iocon 2021 and president of maharashtra orthopedic association dr ajit sinde sir Uh, honorary secretary dr karne sir uh, organizing secretary of iocon 2021 dr ram chanda sir dr parak sanjeev ji sir for giving this me opportunity to coordinate uh, this uh, master class of october 2021 as you know that 20th october is celebrated as a osteoporosis day world osteoporosis day uh, throughout the world so this yes, month we are celebrating Month and the theme of our uh, all webinars on this we have five webinars in this month and uh, the theme of all webinars is uh, osteoporosis. So first webinar we are uh, today uh, having with the Gujarat Orthopedic Association. This is the joint activity of Maharashtra Orthopedic Association IOCON 2021. and gujarat athletes uh, like dr vikas agashe sir dr vikas jain dr pravin kana narayan karne sir and dr dayanidhi desai sir so six speakers we are having three from gujarat three from maharashtra uh, uh, to start with i will request our, uh, and this is also a curtain raiser for iocon 2021 so to start with i will request our organizing uh, chairman Uh, iocon 2021 and president of maharashtra orthopedic association dr give his welcome address and uh, guidance dr sin over to dr sinde sir thank you prakash yeah. respected dignitaries faculties and my dear friends good evening greeting from maharashtra orthopedic association Once again, I, Dr. Ajit Shinde, President of MOA and Organizing Chairman of IOCON 2021, Goa, welcome you all in this wonderful master class series, which has been such great academic discussion and great teachers. Friends, academic has been always the priority for Maharashtra Orthopedic Association, and our goal is to take the advanced knowledge and skill to the utmost prepared level. from this month we are having additional goal of making awareness regarding iocon 2021 goa and convey its update to every different states of india thus on each sunday we are planning to involve another state and today our guest partner is gujarat state i appreciate enthusiasm of president and secretary of gujarat orthopedic association dr vikas jain and dr kamlesh dev murari for accepting our invitation on short notice osteoporosis being a silent disease in aging population leading to many complication like fractures and deformities today we are going to discuss rise and fall of the skeleton introduction definition symptoms clinical examination diagnosis of osteoporosis role of diet exercise calcium supplement and treatment of osteoporosis role of bifosphonate therapeutic type and denosumab today we have expert panelists and faculty for webinar three eminent personalities in this field from maharashtra dr vikas agashe who is a senior orthopedic surgeon from mumbai expert in metabolic disorders and infective diseases of bone and joint dr ram chadda another eminent spine surgeon from lilavati hospital mumbai who is also organizing security of iocon 2021 goa dr narayan karne who is a well known orthopedic surgeon from pune and also moa secretary and treasurer of iocon 2021 
on other side mm. our guest and faculties from gujarat are dr munka jain from wapi who is the present president of gujarat orthopedic association and eminent orthopedic surgeon dr pravin kannamwar is a senior orthopedic surgeon from ahmedabad who does arthroscopy and spine surgery and also past president of ioa in 2003 Dr. Dayanidhi Desai, eminent orthopedic surgeon from Surat, who is also trained in orthoplasty. <coughs> For today's webinar, we are having coordinator Dr. Prakash Shigedar, who is past MOA secretary and president and present organizing secretary of 37th MOA Con 2021 Goa. Dr. Sandeep Biraris, young dynamic orthoscopic. and arthroplasty surgeon from mumbai who is a ec member of both moa and bos and also joint secretary of arthroscopy association of india dr abhijit kare who is another young dynamic surgeon from sain mumbai he is also ec member of bos i welcome all of them i am sure we will have amazing lectures followed by insightful discussion my best wishes for today's webinar and i am sure all these dignitaries will enlighten us on this challenging issue before i rest i take opportunity to invite you all for iocon 2021 goa please register and book your hotels as early as possible presently registrations are more than 2300 and we are expecting figure may cross 5000 and at a certain point we may have to stop the registration because of constraints due to festival and tourism in month of december as we have scheduled the conference from 21 december to 25 december of this year thanks for patience hearing thank you friends jai hind jai maharashtra jai hind you to come and join this big meeting that we are planning for december this year may i share a few things with you one the meeting is 21st to 25th tuesday to saturday last week of december this year yes. it's a meeting that's coming to goa for the first time ever in 66 years and is a meeting that we are attending in a physical form almost after 2 years this is a meeting where we are going to have both academics and fellowship hand in hand and we are looking forward to it a few salient features of this meeting one the academics are going to be held at the dr shama prasad mukherji indoor stadium which is a huge stadium for 4000 people and all around it we have a football ground on one side and a cricket ground on the other we've taken that whole area and would be using it not just for academics but also for the trade and fellowship we have the cme happening on 22nd which is the dr kt dolakya cme which is being jointly organized by the local organizing team and the orissa orthopedic association dr biswajit sahu is liaising with us and it is on a concept of current concepts in orthopedic techniques and technology we are going to have this from 9 in the morning to 4 in the evening on wednesday 22nd following which is the inauguration following which is the inaugural welcome dinner the day prior 21st the day you check in we are working out on a large number of workshops from 2 to 6 pm and we are also having a pg course from 9 am to to 4 or 5 pm that's on day 1 following the cme the main conference would start on thursday 23rd and go on to friday 24th and the first half of saturday 25th 
it's a joint meeting of the ioa and the moa the moa will have its moacon also running simultaneously on the 24th something which all of you would be happy to hear the academics will start early in the morning at 8 o'clock and will get done on thursday by 3 pm on friday by 2 pm on on saturday by 2 pm so you have enough time to spend in and around goa after two or three in the afternoon as dr gs kulkarni who's the scientific chairman along with dr sudhir babulkar and dr tanna they have planned an excellent academic program and have got everything that you wanted together we have 11 gold medal sessions we have three special sessions one which is the dr mulla firoz women session we have one where dr chetan sood and the army cell is going to have a session and a third on special rural orthopedics which is named after the late president dr hkt raza these are all sessions over and above the 11 gold medal sessions we also have seven orations including two past president orations because we didn't have one last year six eponymous lectures and six conference lectures so there's nothing which we are cutting short we are giving you all that we have and more so please come we have more than 2300 registrations in the past six weeks we've only announced this conference after 15th of august and this is on 30th of september that we've cost 2200 and today it's beyond 2300 having said that we also have an excellent cme a lovely banquet planned for you and we look forward to hosting each one of you come with your families come with the intent of spending the entire christmas week there and be happy be academically challenged and go back academically gifted thank you very much see you there thank you very much ram sir uh, today's cme is uh, having the mmc accreditation point one point is accredited and uh, dr ravindra shinde is mmc observer for this activity uh, Dr. Vikas Jain from Gujarat Orthopedic Association President uh, would like to talk something on uh, this occasion. Dr. Vikas Jain, sir. He has raised the hand. So, Dr. Vikas yeah. Jain, sir. So, uh, can you hear me? Yeah, yeah, sure. Yes, yes. Okay. Oh, thank you so much, uh, Maharashtra Orthopedic Association President Dr. Ajit Shinde. Uh, thank you so much, Dr. Ram Chadda. Thank you so much, Dr. Vikas Agashe. You know, it is really a pleasure to do a joint seminar along with Maharashtra Orthopedic Association on behalf of Gujarat Orthopedic Association. I thank the entire Maharashtra Orthopedic Association for this lovely seminar on osteoporosis because this is one of my favorite topics as we have a theme for Gujarat Orthopedic Association as a president, which is orthopedics beyond scalpel in the current year. And bone and joint health is really one of my favorite topics. I have my own DEXA scan in my clinic and we really work on the uh, bone health of most of the patients that I feel is osteoporotic. Uh, I have to uh, seek pardon from the entire committee because I am here in Ahmedabad for a live event that is that already has happened in uh, Gujarat Cancer Research, which was Onco Orthocon. And uh, I have a time overlap, so I have a recorded uh, uh talk i hope most of you would like i will continue to be on the panel as long as i can please excuse me but i would request uh, uh mr dr ashok to play the talk which i have beautifully introduced osteoporosis thank you so much the entire panel thank you for inviting the panel of gujarat orthopedic association we have dr kanabar and dr dayanidhi desai very senior orthopedic surgeons from gujarat and I hope they will definitely do justice to this particular topic. Thank you so much. Thank you very much, sir. Uh, Thank you. Words. Yeah. Uh, Dr. Narayan Karne, sir, is there. Sir, do you want to say a few words? Karne, sir. Thank you. Thank you very much, uh, Tanjana, Dr. Sigedar. At the outset, on behalf of Maharashtra Orthopedic Association, I thank Gujarat Orthopedic Association and uh, uh, IOCon 2021, as well as the Ortho TV for helping us to have an interaction with such a uh, wide uh, uh, number of the uh, delegates or viewers. Uh, the important thing is that as the uh, President Sir has spoken that osteoporosis is a topic which is there, has to be faced to every orthopedic surgeon in the OPD. So these are the ones which they every every 
even specialist person has to give attention to and uh, right from the institute to the peripheral orthopedic surgeon this topic is very important secondly this is uh, there has been so much hammering from the pharma industry that the doctors get confused what to use when and in given condition there are so many medications how you should investigate the person and uh, what medicine or what treatment he should start and how long he should start the treatment so this topic was very important that's why recognized by our professor uh, dr ajit shinde uh, uh, president of moa and now we will have a four lectures uh, in the whole month as a master class so without uh, having much ado i uh, request the organizers to continue and i thank everybody again for joining this esteem webinar thank you very much thank you very much karne sir for guiding us uh, now we will start with our academic session today we are uh, having the first speaker uh, very senior most person from maharashtra and our mentor dr vikas vikas agashe sir and he will talk on rise and fall of the skeleton so i hand over the mic to dr vikas agashe sir for his talk good evening friends it's a great pleasure to take part in this wonderful concept by maharashtra orthopedic association and gujarat orthopedic association so so what happens to the skeleton from birth to till we go to the grave and what do bones do we know they are very strong to withstand physical activity but they need to be light otherwise you can't have efficient movements equally important are they are storehouse of calcium so all these are the three basic things of bones they also we all know that we have a spongy bone and we have a compact bone the compact bone or a diaphyseal region we know they are basically weight bearing and have a mechanical function the others like the vertebra and ends of long bone houses of calcium or play a major role in metabolic activities so what happens from 16 to 60 to beyond or from birth to beyond our uh, osseous tissues don't undergo exciting transformation like other systems but still they are always in a dynamic state from beginning to end of life so we know our height goes on increasing our width goes on increasing our weight goes on increasing what happens to the bones because from skeletal maturity we don't really increase in height or uh, our weight may increase but what happens to the bone so from birth to skeletal maturity the size of bone increases we know that the size of bone increases the width of cortex increases but after skeletal maturity the the size of the bone remains same but the size of cortex increases the trabecular pattern becomes more dense up to about 35 years of up to about 30 to 35 years and at that time we achieve what is called a peak bone mass in both these sexes so what happens our bones um bone density goes on increasing till about 30 35 same in males and females when we achieve what is called peak bone mass after about 30 or 35 in men the density slowly goes on decreasing while in females there is a sudden dip over next 5 7 10 years and then it stabilizes so 7 years or 10 years after menopause are very very important because the females suddenly lose bone density as it is ladies form about 20% less bone than men and for about 7 years they lose significant quantity of bone now of late people have realized that yes even men have andropause like 
andropause exactly like menopause though it is not very common and not very well known but this is a very important reason why bone strength can in decrease how does that happen up to skeletal maturity the volume increases but after that the volume remaining same the number of trabeculae as you can see here the number of trabeculae go on increasing and that is how more bone is deposited in the same volume and bone density increases after it starts losing uh, bone two things happen one the number of trabeculae go down but equally important is the connection between two trabeculae as you can see here the connections between these two trabeculae are also lost or that itself reduces the bone strength significantly how does it happen it is exactly like our municipal roads which are being dug time and again they dig the bone uh, the roads and then deposit similarly the bone about 10% of bone takes part in what is called resorption formation cycle 90% is relaxing so the first thing is the bone gets resorbed and then it is formed if more bone is formed the bone strength or bone density increases but if there is more resorption and the formation cannot match it then the bone density goes down so this thing this cycle lasts for about 200 days the first is resorption by osteoclast followed by apoptosis of osteoclast and formation of membrane osteoblast invade and new bone formation occurs and if this particular thing is deranged then one can have significant osteoporosis and most of the treatment modalities are based on this particular thing either the resorption is reduced or the formation is increased so bones can become weak if less peak bone strength is achieved if there is more digging of bone which would also mean it is more frequently done or the extent of digging is more or more parts of the bone instead of 10% 20% take part in the bone then the more and more bone gets dug or there could be a very poor repair or bone formation so what are the risk factors first and foremost is females about 70% in females the we asians generally have less peak bone mass and if mother is osteoporotic or mother has mother's skeleton has not risen adequately then daughter's skeleton also remains weak the lazy lifestyle again it reduces bone formation inadequate female hormones we it because of early hysterectomy or early menopause or scanty period or nulli parity all that would reduce the the uh, bone formation uh, sorry will lead to increased resorption will finally lead to uh, weak bone thin and lean or zero figure which is a in thing today reduces significantly the peak bone mass we know vitamin d and calcium is vitally important various diseases can incur can lead to fall of skeleton early so in short bone strength determinants or rise of skeleton is dependent on genetic factors there is the gender which are not in our hands but smoking excessive alcohol deficiency of sex hormones thin and lean figure chronic calcium vitamin d deficiency sedentary lifestyle all would lead to increased metabolism or catabolism of bone leading to weakness of bones so the first three factors are unavoidable while these are avoidable so it is said that if your father is poor you are unlucky but if your father in law is poor you are stupid so these are modifiable factors or avoidable factors and you should not be stupid otherwise you will land up having a bone early fall of your skeleton so to conclude 
bones are in constant state of digging and forming or resorption and formation. Peak bone mass is achieved way beyond the skeletal maturity. Hence, this is a very good window period to improve the bone mass. Peak bone mass is the insurance against osteoporosis and additional insurances need to be taken by following good habits. Thank you, friends. Thank you very much, Agashe, sir, for Thank you, uh, enlightening talk. Uh, the second talk is by Dr. Vikas Jain, uh, the introduction and definitions. Sir, are you, uh, I request Dr. Ashok Shaum to run the talk, which he has uh, uh, sent us pre-recorded talk. Dr. Ashok, please. Good evening, friends, colleagues, and office bearers of Indian Orthopedic Association, Maharashtra Orthopedic Association, and Gujarat Orthopedic Association. On behalf of Gujarat Orthopedic Association, as President, I thank Maharashtra Orthopedic Association for inviting panelists from Gujarat in MOA Master's class and curtain raiser of IOCON 2021. My special thanks to Dr. Ashok Sham of Ortho TV also, who has transformed the flow of ortho knowledge using the technology to the best. Namaste to all panelists, Dr. Vikas Agashe, Dr. Ram Chadda, and Dr. Narayan Karne from Maharashtra Orthopedic Association and Dr. Praveen Kanabar and Dr. Dayanidhi Desai sir from Gujarat. Namaste to the coordinators Dr. Prakash, Dr. Sandeep and Dr. Abhijit. Dr. Prakash has made very special efforts in coordinating this seminar. My sincere apologies as I am traveling when this program is live. Request pardon for this recorded module. Going straight to the topic of introducing osteoporosis, let me begin with stating that the theme for my presidential year is orthopedics beyond scalpel. Orthopedics is not only scalpel, theatre and surgeries. Let's all teach the humanity to know their bones, own their bones and love their bones. There is so much in orthopedics beyond scalpel. It's high time that all orthopedic surgeons across globe pledge that we recognize the forthcoming epidemic of osteoporosis and take all necessary actions at the level of local community, state, national levels, global level with the schools, NGOs and the governments to make entire population aware that there is a disease called osteoporosis. It's so silent that it is ignored and it is neglected. Prevention and preservation of bone and joint health should become the passion and higher purpose of every single orthopedic surgeon in the world. Let's strive for decreasing the load of fragility fractures as they form a big socio-economic burden in any society. What is common denominator when in all the conferences and meetings we discuss implant failures, refractures, replacement surgeries, pain and disability in geriatric age, that is osteoporosis. Friends, colleagues, come out from the mental block that we should start our journey from fracture fixations, replacements. We need to start prevention, preservation and regeneration of bone and joint as routine part of our orthopedic practice. Osteoporosis is a systemic skeletal disorder or disease which is characterized by low bone mass, microarchitectural deterioration of bone tissue leading to bone fragility and consequently increase in the fracture risk. Each year, millions of mostly older adults will suffer from devastating osteoporotic fractures caused by simple fall. Millions more will suffer fractures of the wrist, shoulder, pelvis or spine. These fractures are not any accident. The underlying cause is osteoporosis. The link between age-related reductions in bone density goes back to early 1800s. French pathologist Jean Lobstein coined the term osteoporosis. The American endocrinologist Fuller Albright linked osteoporosis with postmenopausal health. Evolutionary aspect of osteoporosis. Friends, this is a very interesting insight. I feel this is very important to understand that the effects of modern lifestyle is affecting the bone and joint health decade early in every single passing generation. Because of more porous bones of humans, 
frequency of severe osteoporosis and osteoporosis related fractures is higher compared to quadruped animals. In humans, vulnerability to osteoporosis is an obvious cost to our bipedalism, making our skeleton more vulnerable to bone loss. Porous bones help to absorb the increased stress that we have on two surfaces compared to the animals, primates, who had four surfaces to disperse the force. Are we working less, meaning that the forces that are required to optimize bone and joint health are diminished by our present lifestyle from generation to generation? This is a very important point that we should start to ponder. It is estimated that over 250 million people globally will have osteoporosis. Osteoporosis becomes more common with age. It is more common in women than men. There are over 9 million fractures worldwide per year due to osteoporosis. 2% to 8% of males and 9% to 38% of females are affected above 50 years. Postmenopausal women have higher risk and higher rate of osteoporotic fractures than older men. Postmenopausal women have decreased estrogens which contributes to the higher rates of fractures and osteoporosis. A 60-year-old woman has a 44% risk of fracture while a 60-year-old man has 25% risk of fracture. Definitely there is a difference in both the sexes. Globally, 1 in 3 women and 1 in 5 men over 50 years of age will have osteoporotic fractures. Especially white and Asian people are at greater risk. However, people of African descent are at the lower risk but the complications post osteoporosis is much higher in the African race. Areas of higher latitude receive less vitamin D, less sunlight and they have uh, which are closer to equator and consequently have higher fracture rates in comparison to lower latitudes. Diet is a big factor that is responsible to this difference as vitamin D, calcium, magnesium and folate are all linked to the bone mineral density. Bad lifestyle, poor exposure to sun, lifestyle diseases across the globe lead to osteoporosis. A large economic burden on the healthcare system due to cost of treatment, long-term disability and loss of productivity in the working population is caused by osteoporosis. European Union spends almost 37 billion euros per year in healthcare costs related to osteoporosis. As well as United States of America spends estimated 19 billion dollars annually in osteoporotic related healthcare cost. Bone health matters to women and their families. In all the countries and cultures, women play a very vital role in the family and in the society. Women over the age of 50 in particular face the increased burden of responsibilities as caregivers to the young and old, breadwinners, preparing for retirement, contributors to the welfare of the communities in which they live, women are more susceptible to osteoporosis. Fragility factors exact a terrible toll on the quality of life of postmenopausal women worldwide. Everyone knows that a family member or a friend who has suffered an osteoporotic fracture, whether it's a 55-year-old sister who has broken her wrist or a 78-year-old grandmother who has broken her hip. All of these women will be seriously affected by these fractures. Because osteoporosis is so common, every woman must come to recognize that bone health really matters to her and the welfare of her family. A vast majority of fractures occur amongst women who are over 65 years of age and postmenopausal women naturally are at the greater risk. What causes osteoporosis in men? Well, men are not left out. Men also suffer from osteoporosis. Beware of the risk factors that cause excessive bone loss. It's not thus the woman's disease. By young adulthood men typically have built more bone mass than women. After around age of 30 years, the amount of bone uh, deposition in the skeleton begins to decline as the formation of new bone does not keep up with the removal of the old bone. Friends, osteoporosis is so silent that it is our duty to make noise. Do not take it for granted. Osteoporosis is definitely a global socio-economic concern. Humankind is entering a new demographic era at the start of next decade. Globally, 
for every 100 people aged 15 to 64 years there will be 14.4 people aged 65 years or above united nations predicts that the so called old age dependency ratio will increase dramatically throughout the 21st century by 2030 the global ratio is projected to be 18 seniors per 100 workers which is set to increase to 25.2 per 100 and 37.6 per 100 by 2050 and 2100 respectively the current global population of 7.7 billion is projected to grow to 8.5 billion 9.7 billion and 10.9 billion by 2030 2050 and 2100 respectively the impact of such rapid shift in the age structure of our global society has enormous implications for how we manage national economies and healthcare systems the prevalence of chronic conditions which affect older people is poised to rise considerably and this will include osteoporosis and fragility factors uh, fractures mainly friends to conclude my vision is a global community with reduced fragility factors in which healthy pain free mobility is a reality for all let's together improve the bone health of the mankind Thank you for patient hearing thank you so much thank you for giving me this opportunity to talk to you address to you about a very important topic that's osteoporosis namaste good evening friends colleagues and all thank you very much sir for enlightening us on the definition and introduction of the osteoporosis now i request senior most uh, person uh, dr pravin kanavar sir who is a past president of iio also to talk on the symptoms and clinical examination of osteoporosis dr pravin kanavar sir please we will take evening friends good evening yeah, friends good evening good evening sir i'm not going into the detail of thanking and everything because it is done thank you so much i'll straight away go to what uh, i want to present as my lecture uh friends as already is mentioned that 28th october is the world osteoporosis day in the slide that you are seeing two women who are meeting after 75 years both are very happy but both have developed severe osteoporosis and you can see the way the back has become this is too late to interfere if at all we interfere let our women for cause being fit at 40 strong at 60 and independent even at 80 that is what indian menopause society wishes that we have i am going to speak on clinical examination signs and symptoms of osteoporosis i was trying to find out a gujarati word for osteoporosis which i could not find but in hindi we have a very good word खोखलापन दैट रियली डिस्क्राइब एग्जैक्टली हाउ द बोन्स हैव बिकम खोखले हो गए हैं दे हैव बिकम खोखला इट इज अ साइलेंट डिसीज इट्स अ साइलेंट टिप विच टेक्स अवे द बोन फ्रॉम बोन माई अर्लियर फ्रेंड्स हैव ऑलरेडी टॉक अबाउट इट टिल द फ्रैक्चर अकर्स द ऑस्टोप्रोसिस इज यूजली नॉट डायग्नोज वी हैव बीन ऑलरेडी इनफॉर्म इंडियंस आर एट द बिगेस्ट रिस्क because we have lower peak bone mass we and our spouse can suffer from osteoporosis this is that can be prevented and treated i would like to share the story of my mother she died at the age of 95 years and she suffered from burning pains all over joint pains fractures scaphoid right side fracture wrist left side carpal tunnel syndrome left side sudex atrophy of wrist left side stiff shoulder incipient compression fracture spine osteoarthritic knees fracture neck femur brain infarcts and head injury and coma she suffered for almost 50 years and finally we lost her so this is what happens when a woman lives till 95 these are the pains which a woman suffers i saw my mother suffer and mothers suffer with tears 
let us make a difference for Indian mothers. This is a picture of our PM Modi's mother, Hiraba, who is again a spine which looks bent. In simple language, Agassi and all the other friends have already explained, osteoporosis means bone is lost from bone. Bone becomes fragile, brittle. Bone can break very easily and bone can break with minimal force. If one has osteoporosis, may have no complaint whatsoever. So every woman who comes to us, particularly after the age of 30, 35, when she is entering the premenopause phase, we have to consider that this is the candidate who is going to go for osteoporosis. If one has osteoporosis, one may have complaints like fall. Here is a 93 years old lady whose pictures are put. She had a fracture neck femur where we had to do a bipolar. She had also fracture of the spine. She had also arthritic changes in the shoulder. This is exactly like what I told you about my mother. People suffer. The ladies, the mothers, they suffer. And we males, we, it's our duty that we diagnose and prevent osteoporosis. I'm very happy that Vikas has already highlighted. And I'm very happy that Agassi has only told us about details about what is osteoporosis. Just receding gums is another sign of osteoporosis. We may have weaker grip strength. And because there is a weaker grip strength, it allows us to fall and fracture can happen. Weaker and brittle fingernails is a very common clinical finding if one has osteoporosis. A woman who has osteoporosis will have night cramps, will have vague body pains, fatigue, and multiple joint pains. The woman can have swelling, pain in ankles and feet. May have back pain, as it is seen in this woman who is young with a fracture, which was never, she never realized that she had a fracture. It was only when we got the x-ray because of the type of back she has that we could see there is a fracture. A woman who has osteoporosis gradually loses the height as it has happened in this old lady. This is how one loses the height. Some controversy is there. Weight increase may happen. Actually, weight increase, when it happens, there may not be osteoporosis. There is a controversy. We'll not go into it. Emotional health issues are very common with a woman who gets the osteoporosis. Anxiety, tension, depression, these are the problems with uh, osteoporotic women will suffer from. And there is another thing which is very important that we need to remember, and that is loss of self-confidence. I can't do something. A woman was so powerful, doing everything, running around. She now feels that I can't do that. And that is something which is going to bring, again, emotional issues. If one has osteoporosis, may have loss of efficiency in the work which one does. So let us summarize what are the symptoms with the person may have. The most important, this disease comes like a thief, no complaint, night cramps, receding gums, weak grip, brittle nails, weak body pains, fatigue, joint pains, swelling of ankles and feet, back pain, loss of height, stroke spine we can call, weight increase, irritation, loss of self-confidence, loss of efficiency, and symptoms of menopause in a woman. And the symptoms are irregular periods, hot flashes, night sweats, vaginal dryness, painful sex, sleep disturbances, anxiety or depression, frequency of urination, hair loss. These are all the problems a woman start getting after the age of 35 when she goes into the menopause. Till she leaves, all these things can go on giving trouble. What are the risk factors? The risk factors cannot be changed are gender. Woman loses bone faster due to menopause. Already explained by Vikas Agassi, the man also gets menopause. Age, bones become less dense and weaker as you age. Body size, small, thin bone woman is at a greater risk. Ethnicity, Caucasian Asian women are highest risk. Family history, parental history of hip fracture, if it is there, the family members can get osteoporosis. Risk factors which can be changed. Sex hormones, if there is hypogonadism, amenorrhea, low estrogen level, is menopause, low testosterone level in men can be 
given the medications. Hypothyroidism, diabetes, and hysterectomy also. There is a question mark I have put because there is no 100% agreement. One may develop osteoporosis. Rheumatoid arthritis, particularly those who are given steroid, will have osteoporosis. Those who have anorexia, a lifetime diet low in calcium and vitamin D can lead to osteoporosis. Use of certain medications such as glucocorticoids or some anticonvulsants can lead to osteoporosis. An inactive lifestyle or extended bed rest, cigarette smoking, and excessive use of alcohol and caffeinated drinks can lead to osteoporosis. Doctors check up. As a doctor, we must maintain yearly record of height and weight. Maintain, we must see that the person maintains balance and normal gait. The patient, the woman should be able to get up from floor or chair unsupported. That she should go on practicing. Back of head and back can touch wall. That is how when she stands, against a wall, can put hand between the chest and pelvic bone and no spinal deformity. When these things change, we have to consider that the patient is going for osteoporosis. Thank you very much for this opportunity to share some of my thoughts. Thank you, MOA and Gujarat Orthopedic Association. Again, thank you very much, Dr. Agassi. Thank you. Thank you very much, Kanavar, sir. Uh, uh, Shubhendu Sir, uh, of uh, symptoms and clinical examination of uh, osteoporosis. Now I request Dr. Dayaniji Desai, sir, to talk on the diagnosis of osteoporosis. Uh, he is again a senior person from Gujarat, and uh, I request, sir, to talk on the diagnosis of osteoporosis. Dayaniji, sir. Sir, please unmute yourself. Yeah. I am not getting my this thing. Presentation. I share my screen, right? Yeah, then start, sir. Where is that uh, my talk? Yeah. I have to go to my desktop, no? Yeah, desktop and your presentation. My desktop, I am not getting. Go to, go to your yeah, presentation directly, sir. Uh, down there, hmm? you, you minimize these windows. You minimize these all windows. Just go on minimizing the windows. Okay, you can, you may, uh, the minimization is on the left side. That, Minus sign, minus sign which is there. There, the same at the where you are crossing, there is one oh, minus okay. sign. Ha, huh, there, that you can minimize, right? You can minimize all the windows. Whatever windows you see, minimize them. I mean, uh, sir, new sir. Yes. No, no, what you do, you come down. Uh, where where you are, where you have put your presentation at desktop. Desktop. Uh, where you come down and on the extreme right, there is one vertical line. The extreme at the bottom and the light side uh, beyond that, huh, there, that there is a desktop. Go, go beyond that and click. No, no, go beyond that. Huh, click there. Yes. Now you see the desktop. Huh? Now yeah, you can yeah, open yeah. it. Yeah. And you can uh, maximize the screen, this full screen. You can make it down there. Down. 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 Or uh, you can make it full screen. And and just, uh, go, go bottom, I'm bottom. Good. At the yeah, bottom. Yeah. Huh? There, there is a TV, TV sky sign is there, TV sign. Up, up there, up there, up, up. And there, you can click that. Yes, right. Oh. Go ahead now. Thanks. Am okay. I audible? Yeah, yes, sure. Yes. Yeah, yeah. Sorry for the delay. And I don't do any formalities of thanking everyone. And now, the, my job is now is to do the diagnostic works of osteoporosis. As we know, it is a silent disease. And patient may be asymptomatic till the first fragility factor occurs. And when we know that fragility fracture itself is a risk factor for another fracture. And we have definite evidences for that. We know that it is preventable, treatable. It has already been uh, told. But we are the first person as orthopedic surgeons to come across the patient having a fragility fracture. We treat the fracture, but we don't treat the disease. There is enough literature evidence 
and there are it is a fact that a, even after a fragility fracture the disease is under diagnosed and even if it's diagnosed it is under treated which leads to considerable morbidity and mortality so it is very important to have secondary prevention for at most to prevent the other fracture to occur the risk factors are already been discussed now the, going for the diagnostic workup as dr kanabar has already detailed the detailed history and a thorough clinical examination to know that whether it is a primary osteoporosis that is post menopausal osteoporosis or say senile osteoporosis or it is secondary osteoporosis because of some other disease that we have to find out and for that we have to do certain investigations like we have to test the bone marrow density by dexa another is we have to fracture this assessment tool is to be done that is frax tool we have to do lateral x ray of lumbar spine and thoracic spine if uh, indicated and there are certain laboratory indications that are needed like cbc esr serum calcium serum phosphorus serum alkaline phosphatase serum liver and transaminases vitamin d intake ph pts serum creatinine glomerular filtration rate serum albumin all these are done for even the treatment of osteoporosis and to know another other pathological condition we have to do special investigation like thyroid stimulating hormone c1 protein electrophoresis to rule out myeloma testosterone in men and we ultimately we may require if possible to do bone resorption marker study now the, the secondary causes of osteoporosis are endocrinopathologies like hypogonadism hyperparathyroidism hyperthyroidism cushing syndrome certain drugs most commonly used drugs are glucocorticoids which can cause we have very common cause of post secondary osteoporosis excess thyroid hormone anticoagulants anticonvulsants cyclosporine rifampicin methotrexate alcohol etc and gi tract disorders which cause malabsorption syndrome or bone marrow disorders like multiple myeloma most important hemolytic anemia hemoglobinopathy myelo and lymphoproliferative disorders and skeletal metastasis is very important these are things that we have to find out now dual energy x-ray exometry that is dexa is the gold standard for estimating bone mineral density and to determine the fracture risk it gives us the t score the j score it is the best tool to confirm the diagnosis and evaluate the severity of osteoporosis it predict future fracture risk it monitor patients on anti when we start anti osteoporotic treatment we can monitor by dexa probably by two years interval and you have also to give attention not only to the t score but just also to the bone mineral density by gram per centimeter square so the t score is it compares an individual's bone mineral density with the mean value for young normal and expresses the difference is a standard deviation it differs at different skeletal sites t score does not explain the etiology the j score is the number of standard deviations patient bmd is above or below average bmd of age match reference population it is not used for diagnosis of osteoporosis there is no specific cut point to evaluate the secondary causes j score equal to or lower than minus 2 bmd below the expected range for range that is there if it is like that then you should consider that there is some malignancy or secondary cause for osteoporosis so j score helps in diagnosing the secondary causes if the j score is above minus 2 minus 2 then patient is having bmd which is within expected range for age according to who t score 8 or minus 1 is or above is normal osteopenia is t score between minus 1 to minus 2.5 osteoporosis is t score 8 or below minus 2.5 and severe and established osteoporosis is t score 8 or below minus 2.5 with more fragility fractures we have two types of dexa central dexa that estimates spine and hip and peripheral dexa that is one third radius or calcaneus dexa test is relatively cheap takes only 2 to 3 minutes and is a minimum x radiation less than even x ray 
and the analysis and interpretation and positioning is important while taking DEXA. Spine DEXA is not helpful if there is degenerative lumbar spondylosis because osteophytes give more uh, DEXA. Finding scoliosis, metallic implants in spine or total hip replacement. In those cases, use peripheral DEXA, that is one third radius. And especially in hyperparathyroidism, uh, one third radius give better information. Non osteoporosis causes of this uh, with a low score, the osteomalacia, it is not osteoporosis, but there will be less bone density. In, 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 in osteogenesis, imperfecta, renal bone disease, multiple myeloma, other mesocy and bone marrow infiltrative diseases. Even in the even with a normal T score, in the absence of other metabolic bone diseases, if there is a fragility fracture, it is osteoporosis. You have to treat it as for osteoporosis. And when there is osteopenia, but there is increased risk according to Frex. That is 10 year probability of major osteo fracture is more than 20 or hip fracture is more than third. You need pharmacological management. So, what are the indications of BMD testing? All women age more than 65 years, those who have secondary osteoporosis, in postmenopausal women with low energy fractures, incidental finding on radiographs of spinal compression fracture, patients on long term more than three months of steroid treatment. And in peri and postmenopausal women, if there is history of uh, early menopause, in men, all men aged more than 70 years should get DEXA scan. And in men and women both, if there is low body weight, previous low energy trauma, smoking, and steroid intake, they should get DEXA scan done. The relative contraindication for center DEXA are pregnancy, recent contrast study, recent nuclear medicine scan extensive orthopedic instrumentation. And if the body weight is so that patient cannot sit, lie down on the table, then you use the forearm. Now, another important uh, entity is sarcopenia. And uh, if sarcopenia is many times associated with osteoporosis, and that is known as sarco osteosarcopenia, this both condition, they deteriorate with age. And sarcopenia can be estimated with DEXA has significant impact on quality of light and survival, and it has an impact on fall, fracture, and frailty. Vertebral fractures are commonly missed or they are asymptomatic, and they are insidious, progressive in nature. They are associated with deformity, height loss, back, back pain, impaired breathing, increased morbidity and mortality. And a spine fracture predicts another spine fracture or hip fracture. That can be Vertebral fractures are often unrecognized, and vertebral fracture assessment is a diagnosis by DEXA machine. It is a visual technique. It gives morphology of the uh, vertebra without measuring the BMD. So in all patients who are more than 70 female or more than 80 male, in which there is a gradual or sudden height loss, uh, they have chronic steroids, then they have to get VMA, uh, VFA, vertebral fracture assessment by DEXA. Now we come to fracture risk assessment tool, which is in 2009, WHS has published. It is easily accessible by primary care physician. It is an online tool, and we have to fill up certain things like uh, the country, patient's name, patient's age, sex, weight, height, uh, previous fracture, parent fractures, hip history, current smoking, uh, current steroids, or rheumatoid arthritis, secondary osteoporosis, alcohol, and fracture neck, neck BMD. All these things uh, will give you a 10-year probability for a major osteoporotic fracture or a hip fracture. If they are more than 20 and 33, then you have to treat it for pharmacological line of statement is indicated. But limitations are there of BREXA. It is applies only to untreated patients. Limited on to ages 40 and 90 years does not apply to premenopausal women. BMD input is only for hip, limited to certain country and ethnics. 
and there are certain risk factors which are not included like family history of fractures other than parental fractures or rate of bone loss, medication other than steroids, etc. Now, the last thing is bone turnover markers, which are products of bone remodeling. They are the bone turnover markers of bone resorption, that is N-telopeptide, NTX, or C-telopeptide, CTX, deoxypyridinolone, and makers of bone formation are bone-specific alkaline phosphatase, osteocalcin, and P1NP, that is pro-collagen type 1 and terminal polypeptide. They are dynamic parameters that reflect short-term and acute changes in bone remodeling status when anti-osteoporotic treatment is started. Used for monitoring the early treatment response and to anti-receptive and anabolic agents and patient's compliance. Baseline measurements and then six months are useful in this period. I think there it ends. The biological markers of bone turnover are they are influenced by storage of the sample. There is diurnal variation. It, it is affected by food intake and renal function. So you have to be careful. They are not in current use much, but they are used for specific conditions and for research purpose. I thank you all for your present hearing. Thanks. Thanks a lot, sir, for a lucid and short presentation on diagnosis of osteoporosis. Now it's turn of our uh, Ram Chadda, sir, who will talk on the role of calcium, exercise, and diet in management of osteoporosis. Dr. Ram Chadda, sir. I would request Dr. Dhaniti Desai to stop sharing his screen. Thank you, sir. Good evening, everybody. I have the honor and privilege to talk about what is Dr. Vikas Jain's favorite theme and topic, which is osteoporosis. And I'll be sharing with you the little that I know about diet, exercise, and calcium supplements in the treatment of osteoporosis. We all know that this is a silent disease. Still, it hits us so hard that we can't take it any longer. What is the treatment of this silent disease? We must understand that as orthopedic surgeons, patients come to us with a fracture. And we have taken a very long time to realize that there's a threefold increase of a patient who's had an osteoporotic or a fragility fracture to have a second and a five-fold increase to then have a third, and then an eight-fold increase to have a fourth fracture. I've learned it the hard way, handling a lot of osteoporotic vertebral compression fractures of the spine. However, we must understand that it's the perimenopausal lady who gets the lower end radius cholesterol fracture, it's the postmenopausal who gets the osteoporotic vertebral compression fracture. And it's the very elderly who get the neck femur or the hip fracture. Keeping this with us in mind, we need to understand that we need to catch them when they have the lower end radius or the osteoporotic spine fracture rather than wait for the hip fracture because that is usually a subterminal event, even in the best of scenarios. Why do I say that? Because despite the best internal fixation and rehab, there is a large majority of patients who are no more in a year's time. A small component do have a permanent disability. A large number, about 40%, are still unable to walk independently and 80% have some disability in their activities of daily living. Vertebral fractures, well, we've seen patients who've been on pain medication for months and years. They've become shorter. They have restricted pulmonary function. They 
lose their interest because they also get sarcopenic, lose muscle mass. They lose self-esteem, get asocial or antisocial, don't get sleep at night, are having severe depression. They may have more than one fracture and they get homebound and dependent. Why does this happen? Well, if we were to look at a cross-section of patients, Hello. maybe Hello. in our own country, and we see 385 of them, and ask them whether they've heard yeah, of video video video. Okay. almost 21% would say that they've never heard of osteoporosis and 79 would say, yes, they've heard something about it. Do you think that the fracture you've experienced, if it's the lower end radius or the, uh, the spine fracture or the hip fracture, is that due to osteoporosis? Well, the majority says, no, 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 no. It's because I fell. They don't realize that a trivial fall may not necessarily be the cause, but the effect of the hip fracture. A neurology may not be the cause, but the effect of an osteoporotic vertebral compression fracture. The second problem, 20% of these patients only who've had treatment and fractures in the past have received diagnosis and medication or treatment for osteoporosis, which means they come with a threefold, fivefold or sevenfold increase in incidence of multiple fractures as they age. This means that there is a major treatment gap, not just with the patients, but with us. And why is that so? Because a lot of us still recently felt that our job is just to fix the fracture. It's only now that we are getting proactive to prevent future fragility fractures, and it's now a multidisciplinary approach. An entity called Fracture Liaison Service, which includes orthopedic surgeons, endocrinologists, people who help with psychologically helping patients, and nurses and physiotherapists all put together would work and would make life much easier for the patient and ultimately for us because we would like to operate on bones which have a good cortex rather than a very thin cortex to fix. How can we prevent these? It's not just educating the patient, but educating ourselves, learning, unlearning, and relearning how to go ahead. It's then that we could have people like this at this age, indulging in activities, which are otherwise unheard of. As I said, it's a metabolic disease. There's a decrease in bone mass. One in two women, almost 50% and 25% men will have osteo-related fractures, porotic fractures in their lifetime. It is a very grim picture, unhappy seclusion for the elderly. Well, we are very, very largely affected in our country. And we have a very, very high incidence of hip fractures and women health is only now being looked at. Is it just aging, primary osteoporosis, or is it secondary to menopause, a renal osteodystrophy, or a GIOP, glucocorticoid induced osteoporosis? Well, usually we have to look for and find the cause. Then we can go ahead and treat them. What are the risk factors? We all age, yes. If my mother had osteoporosis, then as a daughter, I would have a higher incidence. If I'm not taking adequate calcium and vitamin D and my peak bone mass at the age of 25 is not good, I have a higher incidence. I may have osteomalacia to begin with, but I'll end up with osteoporosis. Menopause, which happens at very erratic times. And if we've been using medicines to defer it, we have a high incidence of menopause and then Surgical menopause also expedites and gives rise to osteoporosis. Incidentally, a low vitamin B12 causing an indirectly high homocysteine level can give us osteoporosis. Yes, there will always be exceptions to the rule. You may have a 100-year-old woman who's genetically strong, has taken good wheelchair and calcium and would be 100 years old and still smoking. But these are exceptions. One stalk or swan does not make a summer. So we have to prevent the first fragility fracture. 
stabilize and increase the bone mask, relieve the symptoms, and improve mobility and function. How do we do all this? And go ahead. Well, I talk about the three most important aspects. Diet, which is integral, exercise, and supplements short of anti-osteoporotics. We are a vegetarian country. We belong to a group of people who do not take non-vegetarian food. And we must encourage milk, coconut milk, fruits, vegetables, and indulge in people consuming all that they can to get good quality bone, including sesame seeds. We may not have people who would get access to broccoli very easily, but they can get access to lesser nuts, which also help in bone density improvement. We could have, as I show you, dry fruits, but we could also indulge, if we are non-vegetarian, in various components like fish, salmon being one specifically, very, very helpful. It's soft fish that helps. We should have multiple small meals, which are good in protein, not too high in protein, but also good with calcium and vitamin. We should have a daily amount of these, including cheese, including soya, including sesame, broccoli, eggs, nuts, all put together, and a lot of fruit juice. Of course, combined with all dairy products. Exercise is important. Despite aging, we have to maintain our BMD, improve our muscle mass and strength and stamina, and decrease the incidence of hip and spine fractures by maintaining good balance. We have to indulge in good protective measures so that we don't fall. Unlike what we always thought, the obese are actually less prone to osteoporosis than the very thin and lean vegetarians. We must also be very careful in doing aggressive exercises which don't suit us, and we have to have specific exercise programs. Load weight-bearing exercises prevent bone loss and improve bone density in the senior adulthood. In the young age, High impact exercise is what improves bone density and bone mass. So before your PBM or peak bone mass has been established, you must do high intensity exercises, but beyond the age of 25, 30, 35, it has to be weight bearing, loading, but not high intensity. We can have various exercises, including all the yoga exercises that we have and the Surya Namaskar, if done on a regular basis, will help us. Now coming to the supplement part. We all know that we need calcium and vitamin D3, but we also need B-complex, B12, and folic acid. We need this because vitamin D enhances calcium absorption, improves muscle mass, gets the parathormone down, reduces the bone loss, increases muscle strength, and prevents falls and hence fractures. This is all that we need. Sunlight, vitamin D, fortified cereal, cheese, eggs, tuna fish, salmon fish, and milk. Calcium, well, we have to take it all our life. There are two main calciums available in the market, the carbonate and the citrate. The carbonate has a higher elemental calcium, approximately 40%, while the citrate has only 21%. But calcium carbonate has to be only taken in an acidic medium for absorption, so it has to be taken with food. Citrate or citrate malleate, can be taken any time. Hence, you could use either or. If you're using carbonate, you need larger doses, but at meal time. Citrate malleate, you can take it multiple small doses during the day and can take it on a full stomach or an empty stomach. Please understand, bone resorption increases post-menopause. And my colleague, Dr. Karne, would be then be talking about the anti-resorptives and the anabolics and give you a much better idea. Around 65 years of age, both men and women, we've lost approximately 50% of our PBM or peak bone mass. Why then are we deficient? Well, we don't take too much of calcium. We are vitamin D deficient. We don't absorb much of it through our skin. We have not the best of parathyroids. We have kidney function, which may be challenged. We may be consuming a lot of alcohol. We may be taking steroids and we may have a high phytate diet in our country. Very interesting that we should look at this rather busy slide. 
we must understand that from our youth as we grow to middle age and up to the age of almost 18 years our recommended calcium is up to 1300 mg per day vitamin d at the same time is only 600 iu but to do that you have to take a large component that is the upper level that you can take these are the maintenance doses while these are the higher limits which are the therapeutic doses so vitamin d you can take up to 1000 iu per day some take it even up to 2000 for some time especially during covid times and calcium up to 1 gram or 1.2 per day sun exposure there's always been this huge argument how much of sunlight and for how long i take you to this very important guideline which says sun exposure suggested by researchers 5 to 30 minutes between 10 am and 3 pm at least twice a week to the face arm legs or back without sunscreen gives sufficient vitamin d i tell my patients 20 minutes every day 5 to 6 days a week before lunch or immediately after lunch is the way i recommend we were in the habit of using a large amount of injectable 6 lakh units of vitamin d please don't indulge in it it can get very dangerous to the heart give them plenty of milk and use oral vitamin d3 mind you you very rarely will have hypervitaminosis with oral vitamin d because it's 60000 to the max but this is 6 lakh units and you can have a very dangerous vitamin d3 which can go into hypervitaminosis as i mentioned covid times i have been using twice the number of vitamin d i have been using 2000 iu per day for myself and for people around so rather than give a monthly dose of 60000 we are giving a fortnightly dose of 60000 and we are very happy maintaining the vitamin d as well as supposedly preventing the terminal effects of covid 94% of urban indians like you and i are vitamin d deficient while 70% of those in the rural areas are deficient despite them being completely clothed they are more in the sunlight and they have probably much better quality access to milk than we do well we should have more than 30 nanograms per ml ideally i keep telling my patients it's 30 to 100 30 is passing marks anything below that is failed and you need treatment both with diet exercise and medication what do i do well i tell them take sunlight for sure but also have adequate amount of calcium which i have told you earlier 1000 mg till the age of 70 1200 for women above 51 and 1200 for men above 71 vitamin d is 1000 iu per day regular weight bearing muscle strengthening exercises and do a good balancing and training exercise on a regular basis final part of the discussion does vitamin b have any role well it does high levels of homocysteine are an independent risk factor as far as poor bone health is concerned and if you have low vitamin b12 or you have low folates these can cause a high level of homocysteine and this interferes with the collagen cross linkages which can indirectly affect bone health my final slides how do we prevent osteoporosis do exercise stop smoking eat healthy remember in summary it's a silent disease we get pbm or peak bone mass around 25 decreases after 35 lack of calcium and vitamin d in our country is an important risk factor in india 1000 to 2000 iu of d3 is recommended per day and 1000 to 1200 mg of calcium is recommended per day high daily intake of vitamin d is safe you cannot actually get hypervitaminosis by oral vitamin d vitamin b12 is also very very important finally i have tried to give you a combination of both evidence and experience there are so many people here who are far more experienced than i am but that is somewhere in between that when you unlearn and relearn that you get the expertise thank you very much for a patient hearing Thank you very much, Ram sir, for this lucid presentation. Uh, I think most of the uh, ideas will be clear about diet, exercise, and uh, uh, calcium supplementation. It was an excellent presentation, sir. Thank you. Uh, now 
Now we are coming to the last part of presentation. Our own secretary, Dr. Narayan Karne, sir, will enlighten us on the role of bisphosphonates, teriparatide, and densumab in the treatment of osteoporosis. I will request Karne, sir, to start with his presentation. Thank you. Thank you, Dr. Prakash Tegedar. Uh, I thank Maharashtra Orthopedic Association and Gujarat Orthopedic Association for giving me this opportunity to share this talk. Well, now we have come to know about the diagnosis, what is osteoporosis, how to diagnose it, how to clinically uh, find it and how to investigate it, and as well as the role of the diet and the exercises from this, uh, from our uh, uh, master or orator, Dr. Ram Chadha. Now we'll go to the specific medicines when it comes to this. Uh, sometimes it is very difficult for an orthopedic surgeon to find out what exactly he should give. Okay, vitamin D and the calcium supplements are given for every patient, but when to give bisphosphonate, when to give denosumab, when to give teriparatid in the osteoporosis. So we'll go for that. I think we'll go fast with this, that the definition of the osteoporosis system is skeletal disorder characterized by uh, compromised bone strength, predisposing to the increased risk of the fracture. The bone strength is nothing but the integration of the uh, bone density and the bone quality. And bone quality reflects the architecture, turnover, mineralization, and the damage accumulation, that is the uh, micro fractures in osteoporosis. Now, the next peak bone mass, that is a very important concept which Dr. Agashi has already elaborated. But this is uh, important that it is there only up to the age of 35 years. Now, that is the maximum bone mass one can attain in his lifetime or in her lifetime. After that, the bone mass doesn't increase. Only thing the density increases or decreases. Later on, it can't be increased by any means. So attempt, all attempts should be made to maximize the bone mass before 35 years by giving the adequate calcium, vitamin D supplements, other vitamins and minerals, as well as very important is the wet bearing exercises. The yoga doesn't help or the swimming doesn't help for improving the osteoporosis. So when uh, somebody is doing yoga or the swimming, that has to be supplemented by either walking, running, jogging or any stamping exercises. And apart from that, because I already told about the evidence of the smoking, alcohol abuse, aerated beverages uh, containing phosphates and proper lifestyle. Now, what is the indication for the therapy? That is the history of the fragility fracture, that fracture which has occurred because of the osteoporosis or on the BMD measurements for a normal individual. The T-score is equal to or less than minus 2.5 or in the high-risk individuals, even when it is between minus 1 to minus 2.5, the uh, therapy should be started. The another is the fracture risk assessment tools. That is, if there is 10 year probability of the hip fracture, if it is more than or equal to 3%, or 10 year probability of a major osteoporosis related fracture, more than 20% or equal to 20%. Now, what are the osteoporo uh, osteoporosis management? Basically, treatment is uh, it revolves around two things. One is anti catabolic agent, and these are the agents which prevent the resorption of the bone. That is, suppose that there is a tank which is full of water. Now the tank starts leaking, the big tank which starts leaking and that loses the water. Similarly, the, these are the medicines which stop leaking of the water. But then the uh, in addition to that, the water which gets deposited in the tank, the filling of the tank is also very slow. So that has to be also enhanced. And that is done by the anabolic agents. That is, they are the one which are tank filling agents. So these both are important. Among the anti-catabolic agents, these are the bisphosphonates. There are a variety of bisphosphonates that we'll see one by one. Second is the raloxifene. That is a selective estrogen receptor modulator drug. Means in the post, uh, post menopausal or perimenopausal period, the women should receive raloxifene or other agents which will uh, prevent the rapid loss of the BM bone mineral density or rapid loss of the calcium from the bones. The third is the calcitonin, which is in the nasal spray, and fourth is the denosumab. All these are anti catabolic agents. Now, there are certain anabolic agents which the, uh, enhance the bone formation. And those are mainly it is a teriparatid, and now there are other variants also available. That is the abeloteripide and the rovozumab. Now, obviously, about the bisphosphonates. Now, what do bisphosphonates do? As I told you, they are the one which stop the leaking of the tank, that they inhibit the bone resorption with relatively few side effects as compared to other drugs. It is widely used and it's used for a very long time for the prevention and treatment of the osteoporosis. It is preferred by most of the physicians as initial therapy. One, because of their efficacy, that they're very effective. Second thing is the variable cost. The cost is too less as compared to the other drugs. And third thing is most important, there is a long-term safety data which is available for the bisphosphonates. Now, there are different types. 
One is alendronate. It is a convenient once weekly regime. Actually, it is 70 milligram. In the past, it was a daily regime of 10 milligram, but now we can have a single dose of 70 milligrams in a week. Second, which is available is a resetronate. It's the uh, dose is 150 milligram and it can be given only once in a month. So that is a uh, more compliant as compared to alendronate, which has to be taken every weekly. The third is the alendronate has been shown to be more effective than resetronate at increasing BMD and reducing bone turnover without increasing the risk of the side effect. So alendronate is still preferred by many uh, uh, physicians for this purpose. The third drug is a bandronate, which is also given 150 milligram once a month orally, but it can be available as a parenteral that it can be given IV once in three months. That is only three milligram doses there, IV once in three months. However, the reduction in the hip fracture risk has not been established with the bandronate. The bandronate is better for the spine, while the resetronate is better for the hip. So increases in the lumbar spine and the total BMD were greater with abandronate and alendronate as compared to the resetronate. So that is the difference. The other types is the intravenous zolandronate. It is a very convenient because it can be given only once in a year. That is a, a five milligram once in a year. And but very important that before starting the zolandronate, the patient has to be given at least fifteen days to one month treatment with the vitamin D and the calcium, so that the calcium level in the body it remains normal. Because zolandronate can cause a rapid reduction in the serum calcium level, and that has re uh, resulted in uh, low calcium titanium in some of the patients, which can become a life-threatening one. So always uh, supplement the vitamin D in for one month and assess the serum calcium level. Also, the dehydration can accentuate it. So prior one point of the uh, any IV fluid can be given prior to giving the IV zolandronate. And eGFR should be assessed before each infusion, and which is the eGFR should be more than 35 ml per minute. After giving the zolandronate, the patient can feel a flu like symptoms that the patient has to be warned for this in the COVID era. That patient can have fever, headache, myalgia, arthralgia, and malaise like symptoms for next two to three days, but they can subside with the paracetamol alone. Now, what is the oral administration? The oral administration is a how to take, what precautions one has to take, sorry. One, because this alendronate or the whatever, the resetronate or uh, abandronate when given orally, it has to be taken the glass of water on the empty stomach in the morning. Because, uh, one should not lie down or the bend over for almost half an hour because this can result in the esophageal reflex and for it, uh, to avoid the reflux, better to remain upright for around at least 30 minutes. Another part is that one should not eat for around 30 to 60 minutes after that, one can take breakfast So uh, and then uh, it should be followed by the other drugs because it can cause gastric irritation. And because of this reason, the daily dose which was there in the beginning was uh, un uh, very unpopular. But now uh, once a week or once a month is uh, there, so a patient can uh, do this all ritual. At least uh, he has to do only once in a month. Now, what precaution one has to take? Oral diphosphonate should not be used in patients with esophageal disorders like aclasia or the esophageal structure or the Barrett's esophagus. Also, up to certain types of the bariatric surgery in which the surgical anastomosis are present in the GI tract and in patients with an inability to follow the dosing requirements because they have to be upright for at least 30 to 60 minutes. So those who can't do this, it's better to avoid oral supplements. Such patients can be treated with intravenous bisphosphonate therapy like either the abandonate or the zolentronic acid. The other complications are the Apart from the acidity or the GI irritation is the uh, esophageal ulcers, esophagitis and the bleeding. So these are less with the weekly drug or the monthly drug. That's why now weekly uh, regime is popular. The another important part of the septical subtrochanteric femur fracture has been observed, but it is very rare. So it, it is observed only after five to seven years of the treatment and in which the lateral cortex is mainly affected, often with a localized cortical thing, uh, thickening. And the thing part of that is they very slowly. And uh, but if this uh, treatment is uh, followed by teriparatide, then there are much less chances. Now there are two different varieties of this uh, atypical subtrochanteric fracture. One typical variety is there in which it is a spiral pattern, and there is substantial comminution, and the cortex is a very thin. And second one is a atypical one in which there are transverse fracture or the short oblique fracture. There is no comminution into this, and the cortices are very thick. Another complication is known as the osteonecrosis of the jaw. This has been observed after the three years or the longer treatment for this. And this is with the patient with cancer on this one treatment for multiple myeloma and bone metastasis from the breast, prostate or lung cancer in which randomly generally given to avoid the hypocalcemia. 
This can develop simultaneously or after an invasive surgical procedure such as dental extraction. So while doing uh, any dental procedure, it is better to inquire whether the patient is on the viscosities or not. Patient, this particular complication can occur either uh, without any symptoms or patient can have a severe pain in the jaws. The symptom can mimic routine dental problems such as the decay or the periodontal disease, but one has to observe about this osteonecrosis. Intravenous use of the pamindronate and zonotric acid is associated with most of such cases. Or in oral, it is generally not observed. Now, what are the alleged complications? That one is the esophageal carcinoma, but the current data do not support the causal relationship or association between the oral bisphosphonates and the esophageal carcinoma. And second alleged complication is atrial fibrillation. The information currently available does not show a consistent association and the overall evidence does not suggest causality. There is no convincing mechanism to account for this particular effect. Now, about the drug holiday, when, how long one should give the uh, bisphosphonates? The patient without high risk or who have a stable BMD and no previous vertebral fractures, as in, in who, those who have a low risk of the fracture in the near future in them, after five years of the alendronate or the resedronate, or after three years of the zolendronate, you can give a drug holiday. And in other group of patients, that is uh, the high risk, those are women at the higher risk of the fracture, and who are having osteoporotic fracture before or during therapy, or whose T score is below minus 3.5, in the absence, even in the absence of the fracture, for them, one can continue alendronate or the resedronate for almost up to the 10 years, and zolendronic acid, they can be given for the six years. After that, then you can have a drug holiday. Now, when to restart the bisphosphonate? So, for patients in whom bisphosphonates have been discontinued, it is better to monitor the bone mineral density, BMD, and then one can restart bisphosphonate when there is a persistent bone loss that is approximately 5% bone loss at the femoral neck or on at least two DEXA measurements taken at least two years apart with the same neck and the model of the DEXA scanner. So, in those patients, one can uh, start the uh, bisphosphonate again. Now, another group of the drug that is what's called as the denosumab. The denosumab is the first in class anti rankle monoclonal antibody. They block the rank ligand, which stimulates osteoclast recruitment and activation. They inhibit the osteoclast formation and uh, decreases the bone desorption. And thus, they increase the bone mineral density and they reduce the risk of the fracture. In the Freedom Phase 3 randomized double-blind placebo-controlled clinical trial, it showed that denosumab reduced vertebral fractures by 68%, hip fractures by 40%, and non-vertebral fractures by 20%. These are highly effective in glucocorticoid osteoporosis. The initial therapy in the select patients at high risk of the fracture. In older patients, who have a difficulty with the dosing requirements of the bisphosphonates. Then markedly impaired renal function when the I told you the eGPR is a little bit more and the, there is very low bone mineral density and if the patient is intolerant or unresponse to other therapies. It can be given as a 60 milligram subcutaneous injection every six months for one or two years or till the BMD is corrected on follow-up DEXA of the spine as well as the hip. The only problem with this particular denosumab is an expensive drug so for a single dose, it can cost from 16 to 18,000 rupees. But when it is for the six months, if the con convincing is done properly to the patient, most of the patients, they, act, uh, they allow for this. Now, what are the side effects? One should not administer this particular denosumab intradermally IM or the IV. It has to be administered subcutaneously. The serious infection like cellulitis, dermatoglobal reactions like dermatitis, rashes, eczema have been reported with this. Prior to administration, Better to remove from the refrigerator and bring to room temperature, wait for some time and bring it to almost 25 degrees Celsius. Generally, it takes 15 to 30 minutes. They do not warm in any other way. Don't warm it. Otherwise, there is a problem with the uh, con content of the drug. And sometimes it can cause severe or the incapacitating bone joint or the muscle pain. And it can have a hypersensitivity, allergy or anaphylaxis. And uh, it can induce hypocalcemia. So it is better to monitor calcium levels during therapy, especially in the first few weeks. Now, what are the precautions of denosumab? As I told you, hypocalcemia can develop, so it should not, the patients, especially like uh, Panasperf syndromes, which cause hypocalcemia, they should not receive denosumab unless the hypocalcemia is corrected. Second thing, again, vitamin D deficiency has to be seen. 
because vitamin D has also to be replaced prior to the administration of renal smog. So in all patients, it is better to give adequate supplementation of calcium and vitamin D at least few weeks before giving the renal smog. This is another important. Once you stop the renal smog, it should be followed by subsequent anti-resorptive therapy with either the bisphosphonate or in the women, it can be the hormone replacement therapy or the some uh, uh, selective estrogen receptor modular drug like reluxin should be given because if you don't give this follow-up treatment, then there is a rebound in the bone turnover and there is a rapid bone loss after uh, denosumab is suddenly stopped and you can have an increased risk of the vertebral fracture after that. In the postmenopausal osteoporosis, as I told, the reluxin or HRD also can be considered the patient is intolerant with phosphonate after giving denosumab or even if the without denosumab also you can give that. Now. The next is the teriparatid. The teriparatid is a synthetic parathyroid hormone. It is an anabolic therapy that it reverses the negative skeletal balance. Means other they just stop the uh, uh, um, leaking of the bones or the leaking of calcium from the bones, but then this actually deposits and increases the bone mineral density. How they do it? They stimulate the osteoblast dependent bone formation to a greater uh, degree. So they are indicated in the severe osteoporosis that the T-square is more than or equal to minus 3.5, even in the absence of the fracture, or when the T-score is less than or equal to minus 2.5 with a fragility fracture. Or in those patients who are unable to tolerate or have contraindications to bisphosphonate as we have enumerated, or if they have a fracture and or loss of BMD, in spite of compliance with other osteoporosis therapies, then one can think of the teriparatid. Now, before starting the uh, this, Perform that exa scan, serum calcium level, phosphorus level, creatinine, alkaline phosphatase, alibdimine, 25 hydroxy vitamin D, and 24 oro urinary calcium uh, has to be monitored, and urine creatine also has to be monitored. Then, as I told, supplementary calcium and vitamin D should be given because it's just a stimulate bone formation, but there has to be raw material like calcium and vitamin D which should be deposited in the bone. Then, as is mentioned above, that there, one has to monitor regularly the serum calcium as well as urinary calcium. Both teriparatid and abeloteriparatid, they reduce the risk of the vertebral as well as non-vertebral fractures both. And teriparatid is a safer drug, whereas there is a limited experience with abeloteripide and long-term safety of the abeloteripide is not known. Now, combination therapy. One more point is that this teriparatid also, as a, we can say, the uh, uh, of the uh, label, of the label, it is used is, it is used in the non-unions also, and when there is or the delayed union of the fractures, one can uh, give the teriparatid. Now, about the combination, whether it's, they should be given together or whether it should be given separately. So, simultaneous bosphosphonate with the teriparatid or denosumab with the teriparatid is called the combination, but it is not recommended uh, by the studies that it is a high, a high cost. In the addition, BMD benefits are quite small as compared to the cost. So, there is no additional purvon fracture, uh, fracture benefit. And also there is a conflicted data about which is better, either the combination therapy is better or the sequential therapy is better. Now, what is sequential therapy? The teriparatid increases the BMD in women previously treated with bone bisphosphonate. So if the teriparatid follows the bisphosphonate, it has got a better uh, uh, effect. It is better to administer denosumab or the bisphosphonate after the, some say, it is better to administer denosumab or the bisphosphonate after completion of course of parathyroid to preserve the BMD gains which is achieved by the parathyroid, uh, parathyroid alone. Uh, teriparatid alone. Other agents can be considered if there is a contraindication to the use of bisphosphonate or the denosumab. So it can be used in combination like this. Although teriparatid may be given after denosumab, it is preferable to give teriparatid first followed by the denosumab. Now take home message is that severe osteoporosis need to be treated aggressively. Bisphosphonates, denosumab and the teriparatid play a very important role in this particular treatment. Proper evaluation has to be done before starting the treatment, that is mainly the lab, serum, calcium, fossil, all the levels which are enumerated. Correct indication, regular follow up, and to watch for potential side effect is mandatory to have the best possible result without any complication. Generally, instead of combination, sequential therapy is recommended, and this therapy has to be supplemented with adequate doses of the calcium, vitamin D, and other vitamin and mineral supplements. Thank you very much. Dr. Sigedar, you can take yes, one. Yes, sir. Thank you very much, sir, for this informative talk and uh, uh, 
most of the concepts about density map, teriparatide, and which phosphates might be clear uh, with this presentation. It was very lucid, self-explanatory, and uh, sweet presentation. So uh, with this, we complete all the six presentations of today. Uh, uh, along with me, uh, Dr. Sandeep Birari and Dr. Abhijit Kale are the coordinators. If they uh, want to say something on this occasion, they are most welcome. And we can take the questions. Uh, if any questions are there about the uh, all the six topics covered, uh, we have a five panelists present here. Uh, Dr. Vikas Jain might not be present, but you can uh, answer, ask the questions regarding the uh, uh, topics today covered. Any questions? Dr. Abhijit, you want to say something? Abhijit is there or not? Yes, Sandeep? Yeah, Abhijit is there, Dr. Abhijit Kalesh. Abhijit, 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 you want to say something? Yeah, all the talks were very informative, sir. It's a very good beginning for the initiative by the MOA on a topic of like osteoporosis, which all the orthopedic surgeons see day in and out in their clinical practice. So it's said that well begin is half done. As we have planned that uh, on weekly basis, we will be covering different aspects of osteoporosis in the field of orthopedics. I guess everyone will be looking forward in the coming weeks to prove this, uh, to prove this journey of osteoporosis. Thank you. Over to you, Pat. Yeah, thank you, Abhijit. We will need your help in the when we are having the session on hip. Uh, as you are a joint replacement surgeon, we will take your help in that session. Uh, Sandeep, Sandeep, do you want to say something on this? Uh, uh, no, no, sir. All the talks, every one, everything was very informative, sir. Thank you. Yeah. So, sir, I, I think we can proceed, next, sir. How the uh, viewers on the YouTube are, uh, are will be able to ask the questions? What is the method for them? So, because uh, YouTube viewers can't ask the questions, they should be able to ask the questions. They can just view it. Yes, sir. So, so, is, there is there any mechanism to solve this? Pashoksha. So probably the viewers from the YouTube, they can put their questions in the chat box available on the YouTube and one of the coordinators, we can read out the... No, there, there is no chat box because there are 528 viewers. There's a large number of the viewers there on YouTube, 528. Yes. So they should, there must be some questions because I can't find any question on the YouTube. Yeah. Because there is no, there is no provision of giving the, I mean, questions for them, asking questions. Yeah. There is a provision in the chat box. They can type the questions in the chat box on the YouTube. And can you see the chat them. box there on the YouTube? Can you see the chat box? Yes, yeah. sir. yes, sir. It is there. Chat box. Uh, from next time, we will ask uh, Sandeep or other uh, Abhijit to take care of the questions from uh, the chat audience. Box. On the Special chat care box. of chat box. Uh, sir, they, can, uh, sir, they, can ask, a... they can ask on behalf of the uh, viewers. So there is a chat box, but uh, there are no, no questions. questions. No one has asked the questions. Sir. Okay. Yes, yes. So today we have a, a MMC observer, Dr. Ravindra Shinde. I think he has not joined. I requested him, but anyway, uh, we are thankful to him also. Uh, we'll give him the report. And, he had joined uh, in between. He had joined in between. Yeah, he was joined in between. Yeah, yes. So. Uh, for, ne for next uh, for next webinar, the topic is orthopedics and osteoporosis, and uh, the topics are like problems of uh, uh, fracture healing, problems of uh, fitness of anesthesia, and problems of the implant uh, fixation, and the common sites of uh, fracture in the osteoporosis. So we'll be meeting on next Sunday from 5 to 8 p.m. and that that webinar is with Tamil Nadu Orthopedic Association. The three speakers from Tamil Nadu are already uh, given their names and all. So we we'll next Sunday with the topic of osteoporosis and orthopedics. And from the next hip, spine, and wrist, we'll be uh, discussing more on the case-based discussion. 
rather than the theoretical uh, things, we will be switching over to the case-based discussion. So in, in the next webinar also, we can uh, uh, start the case-based discussion, like uh, what are the problems of implant failure or how, uh, how the implant fails in osteoporosis or what are the fitness problems in uh, uh, treating the patients of osteoporosis and, and what are the solutions. So like that, the next time it will be osteoporosis and orthopedics. So if there are any no questions or no, uh, then uh, we will conclude the session with per permission of the uh, President, sir. Shindesh, sir. Uh, Agash, sir, do you want to say something? I think it's a very good initiative by MOA and is getting <coughs> help and involvement of other orthopedic societies is also very, very good. I really congratulate you and wish you the best. Sir, you are you are our mentor for this uh, the entire month, and you will be there for all the five webinars. I request you to be there yes. and guide us for all the rest of four webinars also. Sure, sure, my pleasure. Done. Yes, sir. Pra thank you, Prakash. Sir. Uh, Prakash, I think uh, already three topics are given to the Tamil Nadu speakers. Uh, yeah, and the three to... topics are remain. Uh, the remaining topics should be declared so that the, our uh, faculties also aware that which topic one has to prepare even we'll we discuss can, we'll discuss uh, we'll discuss and finalize uh, yes sir. i am not saying immediately to give them this yeah, topic yeah, yeah, yeah. Uh, but, sir, uh, we are still live i think we should wind up this program sir uh, yeah we will wind up this and, uh, so 